The Everything Apartments podcast is provided with the support from Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles, better known as AGLA, serving residential landlords throughout Southern California through education and advocacy. Visit aagla.org. Welcome to the Everything Apartments podcast. I'm your host, Eric Christopher, and on this podcast, we cover all topics of multifamily investments from buying and financing properties, day-to-day operations and management, and also reinvestment strategies. Uh, This is episode 29 of the podcast, so scroll back in whatever podcast platform you're using. There's certainly a bunch of interesting topics to maybe get some value out of, and we also love getting your questions about this episode or any past episodes. So if you do have any questions, please call, text, or email. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the contact information on your screen. But if you're listening, it'll be in the show notes of the episode as well. The world of government affairs and apartment ownership has become much more relevant in our industry in the last few years. Many long-term owner families, say here in Southern California, have operated properties for many decades with relatively light interference from government. But now I don't think any owner would agree that that hasn't been ratcheted up, uh, especially to the extreme of the COVID emergency, and I do air quotes emergency. But while many of the COVID emergency items are finally exhausting after years, now we're seeing county and local municipalities using that event as kind of a springboard to double down on their overreach on property owners. Today, we have a great guest who, with her team, are literally soldiers on the front line representing apartment owners in this war with the government. And I don't over-dramatize that by saying war because it really is. But first, I'll tell you about our firm, WSC Realty Advisors and WSC Property Management. WSC has been helping buyers and sellers and managing properties in Long Beach for over 16 years. If you're tired of managing your units or just not getting the results you want, WSC can help. WSC never wants to be the biggest firm in Long Beach. Instead, we stay smaller and more agile to bring the quality you need. We can also help if you're looking to acquire more units here or maybe an out-of-state scenario uh, that a lot of people are now taking to. Visit wsc-pm.com. Call, text, or email us. Again, all that information's in the show notes. Mention the Everything Apartments podcast and get your first two months of management absolutely free. Whatever your challenge with your property, WSC has the solution. Today we have with us Janet Gagnon, who is the Director of Government Affairs and External Relations with the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles, again known as AGLA. Janet has worked for over 25 years in government affairs, not only with AGLA, but with California Association of Realtors as Director, Public Policy, Alzheimer's Association, California, South Atlanta's Director of Public Policy and Advocacy. So she's had a couple different industries of doing this sort of work. Janet is a Juris Doctor by way of Loyola Law School here in Los Angeles and also attended Cal State University Northridge. Janet is one of the few in the proud LA area natives, having been born and raised in La Crescenta. Janet, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. It's great to be here. You, like me, again, uh, born and raised here, and as we go along and the population increases, you find fewer and fewer of us left here as opposed to the people that in-migrated into California for somewhere else. Yes, absolutely. Now, tell me about, let's do just a little comparison contrast. You grew up here. I grew up here, you know, kind of thinking back to high school. I mean, it really feels like a different place entirely. Now, that could obviously be... Uh, us growing older and <laughs> taking in a larger context of the world around us. Let's hold that one to the side for a minute. As far as just kind of the sensibility, obviously, you know, more people and, and more development and just more density kind of can change that a little. But just give me a quick, fun little antidote of, of how it was growing up in a place like La Crescenta and maybe the difference of what you see it being now. You know, when I was growing up, La Crescenta was a sleepy little town uh, on the outskirts of Glendale. Growing up through that, we've just seen such a boom in housing, in uh, services, in restaurants, and everything else uh, being fully developed. 
and bringing a lot more folks to Southern California and to Glendale in particular. Uh, and it's become much more diverse. Lots of folks from lots of different, different countries, different states coming in, uh, loaning their diversity. It's certainly great for food. You can't beat Southern California for food, but it also has different perspectives. It has a, an energy to it. Uh, so I really have welcomed that. But on the government side, which is usually where I spend my days, it's also significantly changed to be more of a focus of government, please fix my life for me versus get out of my way so I can run my own life. Yeah, that, and that's a great depiction because if we if we kind of shift over just general life here in the you know 70s and 80s growing up into the the business focus where, you know, we've got relatives and I I have that, you know, came back from World War II, started a business and kind of ran it. And it's now second generation, kind of like talking about my grandparents to say my parents, where business in general with fewer people and fewer layers of bureaucracy was easier to do. And then laying over one more lens over that in the rental property business, you know, the government's always been there, right? We have to get our services from them, utilities and code enforcement. And the thoughts that I get from my more, say, senior family members is they were there, but they weren't a huge nuisance. They were just a small nuisance and it wasn't really something that moved their needle. I've been doing this 16 years, but certainly there's a lot of owners listening to it. The families have been in it for decades, maybe since like World War II, like my grandparents, that even in my 16 year career, I've seen the increase in the government overreach just on an uptrend and then a parabolic uptrend when COVID hit. Now, what do you think the root cause of that really is? based on your experience being literally on the front lines. Well, I agree with you. It's definitely snowballed and picked up a lot of steam within the last few years, especially for uh, regulations on rental housing providers and regulations just in general for everyday citizens that it used to be the government was there as a backstop. They provided safety nets for those who needed it, a baseline for everybody to live by as a society. And now they're much more in the, the front lines trying to push agendas, trying to push their views, meaning our elected officials on how people should be running their lives and what people should and shouldn't be doing. And certainly we've seen that in rental housing that as you said, uh, at one time they were in the background and then they came forward and we were working as partnerships that I have many members that have been in the business for multiple years and even a few decades for some. It was shown as a partnership. Rental housing providers provide housing that's needed to folks that can't afford to buy single family residences or condos or other purchased housing. Th those authorities saw us as, as their partners and we worked to resolve differences. We worked collaboratively with them. And now they've shifted to be really adversarial towards our members and seeing us as not part of the solution, but as difficult people, uh, evil people for merely owning housing and providing rental housing to those who need it. I made this comment recently to our housing authority that had a discussion forum. And I said, we really would like to go back to the days that you work with us collaboratively as partners. We all want to come together to solve the housing issue. Um, our members are only one piece of the total puzzle. Everybody wants to live in a peaceful environment and so do our owners. Get away from this us versus them mindset that seems to have infected many of the agencies and unfortunately some of our elected officials as well. It really causes me to scratch my head to the to the idea of what's the end game. So you've you've got an industry that's providing a necessary service and specifically here in Southern California where the rent to own gap is so big. What's the end game for these these governments where we already know we're underhoused here by a lot? Certainly we can all look at it and say, hey, it's so much cheaper to be able to build something out of state somewhere, it doesn't matter where, the entitlement fees and the red tape and the bureaucracy to build a living unit is made so hard here. So, okay, well, that the result is we're underhoused. So the next step along the way is 
Well, now, okay, let's go after the landlords because I think in a lot of people's minds, they think this housing thing should be a socialized thing where mm -hmm. they deserve housing. And all of a sudden you've got like in this state, we're so deep blue, we're never coming back from it. And, and the government seeming to like pander to that to the expense of property owners. We saw all of these COVID restrictions that were placed on us. Thank God more or less of them are exhausted themselves. What I'm reading in your articles and you kind of intonated the other day is that the cities now, well, let's say county and cities are kind of using that as a springboard to keep their overreach, maybe doubling down on that. I mean, what's going on with that? Yes, they, they definitely are pushing to stay in the cocoon uh, and they want government to stay in, in front and in front of renters and against rental housing providers uh, to, as you touched on, really turn our market rate rental housing owned by small mom and pops, lots of retirees, lots of uh, people new to the country stepping in the door of, of property ownership. And they want it to become public housing. And they're using a new term now called social housing, but that's basically what they're describing, that they believe property ownership is somehow evil. It used to be the American dream, but now if you've achieved that dream, somehow you're a bad person. It's, it's really sad to, to see that mindset seeping in. And, the, and we've had it going on for a bit of time. We've seen it certainly in Los Angeles City, where three of the new city council members are declared democratic socialists. That's the platform they ran on, and, and they own that title. And now they put forth a motion just yesterday for social housing, which they're describing as basically a co-op situation with a rent to own component. Unfortunately, the, these folks don't seem to understand that just because you don't like the laws of economics doesn't make them any less valid, that they're still there. The owner, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a small mom and pop, whoever that owner is, still needs rents coming in to cover costs, uh, whether it's repairs, whether it's maintenance, property taxes, trash collections fees have skyrocketed, insurance has skyrocketed. So there's all of these fees. It is really a small business. It's a local business, just like a neighborhood grocery store. Uh, but for the last three years, our members have been expected to not get paid at all for the services they've provided throughout COVID and that the renters have enjoyed as their housing. This shift is definitely a planned one um, by certain parties. And we've been looking to our city councils to do what government is supposed to do, which is bring people together, find a fair and balanced solution. They're supposed to represent all of their constituents, not one pocket of constituents versus another. Unfortunately, a few people have gotten seats both at the county level and at the city level that don't believe that anymore that they believe their allegiance is only to one group. And certainly that's something we're looking to change in 2024, especially in LA City, where we have multiple seats coming up. And we definitely need to bring that fair and balanced approach back to local government. I've talked with a number of people, even on this podcast, you know, Dan Yokelson, obviously city of LA is a great big uh, gorilla in the room when it comes to Southern California. Shed some light on the county of LA and maybe some of the cities in the South Bay, Long Beach. What we're looking for here is not to sit and cry in our beer because we've had plenty of time to do that during COVID. What we're really trying to do is figure out what we can do effectively to push our agenda to you know at least closely match what's being pressed against us. So tell me about the 2024 elections, maybe with County of LA? Well, with the county, one of the supervisors, Supervisor Catherine Barger, is running for re-election. She has been the shining star of the five for rental housing owners. She's the only voice that has repeatedly and consistently brought measure and fairness to their discussions about rental housing. Certainly, we are supporting her. Uh, AGLA has its own AGLA PAC which people can contribute to via our website. 
And we have already endorsed, provided funding in support of Supervisor Barger's re-election bid for 2024. We definitely need her voice to continue there for us. We hope that that a voice of reason will continue. She was a key vote, uh, as well as Supervisors Hahn and as well as Supervisor Mitchell abstaining, so that the proposed just cause that they wanted to keep going just recently throughout the entire LA County was voted down. And so that was, as I said, thanks in part to Barger and Hahn's votes opposing, as well as Mitchell abstaining, so that uh, supervisors Horvath and Solis, who brought forward the motion, were unable to get it passed. So definitely an important race for LA County. Uh, LA County is, however, looking at doing a renter summit and push out to all of the incorporated cities, the existing LA County ordinance that's only applicable to unincorporated areas of the county for rent stabilization, which is also rent control. They like to switch up the labels, but there's not a lot of substantive difference between the two. And they want these additional restrictions on owners put in place. It, it's a very disturbing concept that they're now jumping ahead of what state law already provides and has been providing by AB 1482 that went into effect January 1st, 2020, uh, that is a statewide rent increase limitation, a maximum of 10%, as well as several just cause, so to speak, eviction restrictions, so that you have to have a reason that is sanctioned by the state to be able to remove someone from your property and to pay relocation fee. And that was right as COVID was starting. And so that state bill didn't get a lot of attention at the time. But now that the eviction moratoriums have ended that basically froze everything, it's coming into effect. And the cities are now saying that's still not enough, that we, the cities, have to put in even more restrictive limitations for rental housing owners to have to jump over to stay in business. You know, that that's why, as you said, LA City is definitely the gorilla, but those bad ideas spread. They like to, you know, do the dog and pony show around to try to outdo each other in bad ideas between the county, the city. Uh, they're in competition with San Francisco up north with who can provide the worst ideas to make it the most difficult on rental housing providers. Yeah, no doubt. It's a convoluted group. I don't believe that the government, I don't believe they care at all about owner. I don't believe they care one bit. And it's kind of funny because not just owners of apartments, but owners of businesses are contributing money into the into the coffers of the government. You think, well, you know, intuitively you and I would sit here and think we should help those people. We should help them succeed because the more they succeed, the more money we can get from them. And you know what? It's uh, based on what you were sharing with me a minute ago. It seems very similar in each of these municipalities, be it city, county, it seems as though on each of these, let's say city councils or board of supervisors, you've got a couple that are business friendly. And and your phrase that I like was, I guess, fair and equitable or fair and balanced. You've got a few of them that are like that, but the majority is not. So I'm always kind of wondering, will we ever make any ground or are those people's votes wasted? Are our calls to our councilmen. Does that really help? I don't know if I believe it does, but you may tell me something differently. It absolutely does. It makes a huge difference. The number one most effective way to sway either a county board of supervisors mind or a city council member's mind is to show up. Show up to the city council meeting, show up via Zoom. Some of them have Zoom capabilities that you can even call in. You don't have to get in your car, but make your voice heard because we've had that, like I said, LA Board of Supervisors was gonna extend that just cause, but it's because our members and other owners turned out in force and said, this is not okay. This must end, this must stop. We, we won. You know, that was the good news. And even in the smaller cities, we just had a situation in Pomona this last week. Pomona is heavily, as you had touched on at the beginning, heavily renter 
that's the majority of the people that live in the city of, of Pomona, but we had a major city council meeting. Our members turned out. They wanted to drastically increase the relocation fees. They wanted to increase those relocation fees to the LA City model, which pays up to $22,950. Now tell me that's not a windfall for the rest. That's ridiculous. I mean, you know, it's a lot of this stuff puts its its pinky toe on ridiculous. And, and now it seems like something like that is just pure, unabashed ridiculousness. Yes. But j- getting back to the more positive side. So you're- But, but you know, the positive side is in Pomona, our people turned out and as did we, we, we actually submitted three different comment letters because they had pulled it twice from the agenda and put it back on. I don't know if they were trying to reduce people's turnout um, and engagement or what was the situation there. But because of our turnout, we were able to get them to reduce the increase by 33%. When our members engage and make their voices heard and take the time to show up, Zoom call, send an email before the meeting, or make a call directly to their city council member, Uh, or the entire city council is is better for the small cities, it makes a huge impact. Yes, it absolutely does. Okay, that's good to hear because I've been preaching for a while, like since COVID began, that we all need to get off our asses and engage. Let me see if I got the progression right with you. This goes without saying, I'm, I'm not paid by AGLA. I'm not an employee of AGLA, but I do recognize that AGLA is doing the heavy lifting out there in organizing these counterattacks against this overreach. So if I got the the places where we can help when we get these alerts, however we find out about them, whether it's by ourselves or through Aglo or from somebody else, is that we do need to be diligent and very proactive about contacting these elected individuals because it does make a difference, A, by phone or email, but B, you're saying if your face is in the place, it's going to mean a lot more because- I've seen these meetings, like you've seen a bunch more than I have, but I go to them in Long Beach periodically, and the tenant rights groups are there in force. They seem very organized. They seem like maybe they're they're funded up, but Dan would tell me they're very funded. But there isn't as many landlords there, so we need to change that. Then we need to also support you all because times have changed. This kind of dynamic is not going to go away in California ever, so that as owners, whatever donations, if you're making them now, great, maybe a little more. If you're not making them, you're missing the ball because you've got a well-trained army here in Janet and her staff and the association, but they need us to, to provide a little more to help. We are farming new advocacy teams so that not only our members should be showing up to the city council members Uh, to the meetings themselves and and putting their butts in seats and standing up and asking to speak, signing their speaker cards. We're engaging advocacy teams. So anybody that wants to participate, we want to bring you with us to our one-on-one meetings with your local elected official. We also reach out well in advance of the city council meeting to till the ground and educate the city council members to our position, our, why our members are in business, why these regulations are difficult. Because as you said, you know, when you get to the city council meeting, it's almost a mini theater. We may never have equal numbers, but we certainly want as large a number as we can get of those housing providers to show up and say, we're your constituents too. We also need to fight back on the false narrative of the renter advocates that are saying all owners are corporations, all owners are REITs. And in Southern California, that is absolutely false that our own members are primarily mom and pop owners, that the elected officials are buying these lies from the advocates, the renter advocates, saying, oh no, those people aren't really real. Well, they are real and they need to see those faces and they need to hear those voices. The most powerful impact is for a person to go into a legislator's office, local, state, or federal, and tell your personal story. Nobody tells your story better than you. In addition, we're also starting a video uh, push to put faces onto small 
and medium-sized rental housing owners. And we're going to be pushing out a whole campaign to request our members to send in their own video using their smartphone uh, and do a two-minute video why you got into the rental housing business what keeps you going and why you want to stay, you know, what's the, the best thing that's happened and the worst things that's happened to you. How does somebody get involved with doing one of those videos? Is that an upload? Reach on out the to Agla. We, we have our staff contacts on our Agla website, or they can email me directly. It's Janet, J-A-N-E-T at Agla, which is A-A-G-L-A dot O-R-G. I'll have your information in the in the show notes too. We're lucky to have you, you know, Agla and yourself specifically be in the front line of, of force against these, you know, kind of negative impacts we have. We're lucky and, you know, certainly times have changed and we collectively as owners and managers and, and people involved in the industry have to get proactive because the other side's never going to slow down. Owners, you know, they may or may not be members of Aglet this time, but certainly may have a question or two. I highly recommend, hey, look, these folks are doing the dirty work. They need our help, but they also need your money, too. And if we know the other side is going to uh, keep their fight up against us, so we, we've got to do it. There's, there's no two ways about it. Janet, I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I look forward to next time. This has been the Everything Apartments podcast. I'm your host, Eric Christopher. Stay tuned for another episode coming soon.